Even before the first production Panther had left the production line, concerns started being voiced that perhaps the armor on Panther was not sufficiently thick to resist Soviet 14.5mm anti-tank rifles fired at close range. As a result, in January 43, a program was started for Panther II. By February of 43, in a rare attack of sanity in the German procurement system, it was decided that perhaps Panther II should have commonality with the Tiger II that was being developed. So as a result, it would share road wheels, steering gear, powertrain, transmission. Uh, even the tracks could be shared because the combat tracks of Panther II could be used as the transport tracks for Tiger II. In the summer of 43, a Versuch's Panther II hull was completed. Now it turned out this was mainly for the sake of the order because by May of 43, it seemed pretty obvious that Panther II was not going to go into series production. The hull survived the war, was brought back to the US, and can now be found in the Army's National Armor and Cavalry Collection in Fort Moore, Georgia. Being a prototype vehicle, they didn't bother with a lot of things such as stoic. It's a little bit bland. I mean, you stick a headlight on the front, well, you kind of need that for testing, but not much else. From the front, the vehicle does look rather a lot like a Panther. Uh, but there is a not-so-noticeable different. This front plate here is 10 centimeters sloped at 55, whereas regular Panther is only 8 centimeters. Now, the lower hull remains at 6 centimeters. It's the same for both. And you can see how they have the interlocking system that the Germans used for their thicker plate. Otherwise, though, very similar. They have the same bow machine gun for the Funker, for the radio operator, complete with the hole for the actual machine gun, and another hole for the optic. He has a single periscope. Now, Panther also gave the uh, bow gunner a single periscope, but it, at least uh, the ones that weren't the very first ones. When you had, okay. When you had the letterbox bow gun, you had three of the optics. When they moved to the ball mount, they took away two of the optics, they left them with only one fixed direction periscope. On this one, the periscope is traversable, so the Funker has a slightly greater range of vision. All right, so the other thing of note here is the towing system. So the side armor you can see here is a bit thicker. It's now gone up to uh, six centimeters instead of the earlier four and a half. And it has holes in it instead of the more traditional hook mount. And the idea was that you had a special A-frame uh, contraption or you would use clevises with tow ropes, hook into this and then drag the machine around. Now, if you're dragging, this is fine because you can get a regular clevis and your tow rope and all as well. But if you want to reverse the thing, you want to push it, you need something solid like an A-frame. And everybody else's A-frames don't fit onto this thing. So museums hate this because you've got to invent some sort of a contraption that you can adapt your A-frame to stick onto here and, or any German vehicle and push it around. Okay, we need to talk turret. Now, because only the hull was built in order to make the thing look a bit more like a tank, somebody plonked an Aus G turret from a regular Panther on top of the Panther II chassis. Now, Panther II was going to have its own specially designed turret. This was not, I'd say again, not small term, which was a very late war development. Instead, a Panther II's turret was going to be a variation of a Schmaler Blendensausführung, give or take, or narrow mantlet design. But in terms of general shape, it was very similar to a regular Panther turret, just thicker. So the mantlet would be 15 centimeters instead of 10. The front turret armor, 12 centimeters instead of 10. Sides and rear, six centimeters instead of four and a half. Turret roof, three centimeters instead of 1.6. But this does at least give you a general idea of what Panther II would look like if it were actually built. Now, they didn't decide to simply make it tougher for anti-tank rifles to penetrate Panther II. They also decided to increase the armor overall. I've already talked about the front slope 
and the turf, which obviously an ATR is going to affect. Sides, they've also thickened to six centimeters instead of the original four and a half. Coming down to the tracks, they are 66 centimeters wide. Now this must be at the extreme outer edge of the loading gauge because they have cut the tracks right at the edge here. Most of the German tracks, they have extended pins that come out and you can place a retaining washer and a cotter pin. That stops the track from falling apart. They apparently didn't have room for this here because the pin stops at the edge of the track link, which means that there is nothing holding the pin into place. And so what happens, you may ask, if the pin starts to work its way out? They thought of a solution. Or did they steal a solution? They have a ramp. As the pin is sticking out a little bit too far as the track is coming forward, it hits the ramp and gets slammed back into place. The difference between this and the T-34's ramp is that the T-34's ramp is at the back end of the tank, and this one is at the front end of the tank because the drive wheels maybe are in different places. But that alone is evidence that the Germans did not simply copy a Soviet design. The sprocket wheels are similar to, but not identical to those on Tiger II. Actually, there are a couple of other differences in running gear. The suspension arms are different as well. What are not different are the road wheels and the alternating interlock method of these road wheels compared to earlier Panther. Now, these are the steel rimmed road wheels, the Gummi Sparanda Laufrollen. Again, apologies to German speakers if I am butchering your language. I'm Irish. We, we traditionally never get other languages right. Our accents are terrible. I, I, I get complimented on the accent actually a few times, but when it comes to speaking foreign languages, it's a problem. You should have seen me in a French division headquarters. And they understood me. And I'm probably staggering behind their backs. So anyway, no matter. The theory behind the rubber saving road wheel, because that is what the Gummi Sparenda Lauf Roland means, is that, well, Rubber is a little bit of a short commodity in Germany at the time, and anything that could save the use of rubber would be appreciated. So by placing the rubber inside the road wheel, and you, you'll have seen this also on some of the Jägpanzer uh, road wheels, on Conqueror's road wheels, you have steel on the outside, because that's the bit that's most likely to get hit. Rubber shocking uh, correction, protecting the shock, and the vibration between the outside and the inside, and then the inside is connected straight onto the suspension. Didn't work out all that well in practice. After all, if it worked that well, more people would have done it. Two problems. A, it never really attenuated the vibration sufficiently. Attenued? Attenuated? One of those two words. Uh, the vibration sufficiently, so it, it, it didn't work out in, theory, in practice as well as it did in theory. And the other flaw was the whole road wheel system was heavier. Now, it was considered, again, a, a good idea to have these steel road wheels, but could you mount them on Panther? Did he have to use Panther 2 to do it? Because if he could take these road wheels and put them on Panther, fantastic. Now, eventually it turned out that you could put a couple of road wheels, but there was a bit of a flaw, so they didn't make very many of them. One of the flaws in question is the sheer weight of these steel rimmed wheels. If you make no other change to the vehicle and you simply replace Panther's original rubber tired wheels with these steel tired wheels, you've added two tons to the overall weight. Now you start to apply this to Panther too, because not only have we made the side armor thicker and the front armor thicker and the turret armor thicker uh, and generally added weight there, you have now added an extra two tons or so just to the wheels, and what was originally a design specification of about 40 ton for Panther is now a better part of 47 ton for Panther II. So to move all that weight, you need a new engine. The engine, of course, is at the back, but so are two other items of note. Firstly, of course, I have not yet talked of track tension. Well, as you would expect the idler wheel on Panther II is mounted on an eccentric arm. So the, the attachment point for the arm to the hull is up high and the uh, hub itself for the idler is a little bit lower. 
So as you tension the track, it comes in and out. To do so, you got ports on each side. You stick a tool in, you crank away, and then it'll adjust your idler. The other item that requires cranking is the inertial starter. Now, German vehicles generally did have electric starter motors. Oh my god, the Russians are coming over the hill. We need to get the tank going right the heck now. Push button and start. But it was not the primary form of starting the engine. It's too risky. Instead, there was an inertial starter. So you put a crank in here, and there's, there's video of this on YouTube for starting a King Tiger, starting a Stungushutz, probably starting a Panther, although I don't remember seeing it. So you stick it in, you got a couple of guys start cranking. There's a big flywheel inside. Eventually, the flywheel will get up to speed and you pull a release latch. This now connects it to the crankshaft, starts the engine turning over, and the engine will then start once you add the uh, electric power. That was the preferred, reliable, doesn't do any harm to the vehicle method of starting. So now, the engine. So the engine they decided to go with was the Maybach HL230, 23.1 liters, cranking out 700 horsepower at 3000 RPM or 1850 Newton meters at 2100 RPM. Now remember, this is at the time that Panthers were being produced with HL210s. They hadn't yet converted over to the 230. The 210 was only 650 horsepower. So the thinking was that even though Panther II was going to be the better part of 7 plus tons heavier than regular Panther, it would be about as mobile. Road range was also going to be about the same. There's 700 liters of fuel that will come into this thing. And I have to say, the, the way the engine deck is laid out, filling the fuel tanks alone seems like an interesting chore. Indeed, simply opening up this hatch, it took myself and fix it in post, both of us to lift this up because remember they've added uh, an extra 14 millimeters to the thickness of the engine deck roof but they didn't make the hatch any smaller other oh, features on the back deck they use panther 2 as almost a test bed for later panthers as well so if you look at the engine decks of regular panthers if you compare the earlier panthers such as the d or the a with the later production like g you're going to see that the engine deck configuration and items have slightly changed, and the G model is much more similar to what you have on Panther II. Other features, well, the louvers on top of the radiator fans, they are common to Tiger II. And these big holes, which I almost fell into, they do come with wire screens, wire mesh screens, to stop large items like your foot going into the system. Just before you open up the hatches to the front hull, and don't, don't set your expectations high for the condition inside, by the way, but when you're dealing with a one-of-a-kind vehicle, you take what you can get. Uh, just observe the two hatches are part of the larger transmission hatch. So if you do have to pull the transmission, rotate the turret, pull this out, pull all the components out in the middle, then pull the transmission back up and out. And, uh, well, that's how you do it. So... In we go. Fortunately, the army just gave me a new tetanus shot there a couple of months ago. Getting into the radioman's position is a little bit tricky because unlike the driver, the radioman's position is a fixed cushion, uh, very far down, very far forward. And yeah, you gotta come down and then scoot forward a little bit. It, it's, it's a bit annoying, especially when it's an old vehicle and you wanna be careful what it is you're standing on. I have no doubt a service vehicle will be a little bit more convenient. Uh, there are a couple of other things that are perhaps missing in here, but again, this is a more of an engineering test vehicle, not a full on vehicle. So you know, you're gonna understand that some things are missing, but they did at least still mount a frame for the radios on top of the transmission. Now this again is all very much similar to Panther 1. So you can see the transmission comes to the front then spreads out to the brakes and final drives. In front of me I have a gap for my feet. My legs, they're, they're okay. This could do a little bit more range of movement. 
but not too bad. Of course, I am also right in front of the spinning drive shaft of death, which I want to be careful not to get my clothes caught in. There is an easy answer to this. You just put a little, a little guard in front of it. Some German vehicles have it. Oddly enough, a central call Panther 1 I was in didn't have one either. So maybe they thought it was less likely on a Panther than some other vehicles. The band mount, same as on Panther with a little headrest, main machine gun, aiming sight. That traversable periscope I mentioned on the right here still traverses quite smoothly, which is impressive. Uh, you can see from the width of it again how, how it is that it comes up and out. So the back end of that transmission panel. So the front is here, the back is right next to the camera. Uh, so the back end of the transmission, once you unhook it from the universal coupling, goes pretty much straight up while the front slides back and then the whole thing comes up lengthwise, basically on a headstand. I see it as I mentioned, doesn't, uh, doesn't move. Plenty of space on the right. That uh, round thing, I wasn't quite sure what it was on the whole side, it was also on the opposite. You can see it's a mounting point here for a shock absorber. Now, as you're looking down, you can see that the, trend, the torsion bar arms are, are, correction, the torsion bars are different. So on a regular Panther, the torsion bars are double width. So they'll be anchored on one side, go all the way out, do a 180, come all the way back to the road wheel arm. On Panther 2, they are simple, thick, one way, anchored at one point, all the way through to the road wheel arm on the opposite side. So they, they stop the out and back. Otherwise, I mean, it's, it's the radio man's position. Uh, nothing unusual, especially given that it is a test vehicle. So uh, let's have a quick look on the opposite side. I suspect just looking at it, this is also going to be very, very similar to that on a Panther. Uh, in fact, as I'm looking, I'm not even sure I want to try sitting on it, but let, let, let's see if I can. Now, Panther is a little bit unusual in that the driving position is basically duplicated. Uh, not as in left driver, right driver, but as in there's two sets of controls, more or less, depending on if you're head up or head down. Uh, there's that much of a difference. So obviously I'm in the head up position, so I would drive firstly. Uh, the pedal for uh, the accelerator is a little bit close to me. I, would, I, I can actually engage the lower pedal from here, but then again, that's me being 1 meter 98. So I would assume that your typical German of the time is going to have less of an issue with the accelerator pedal. Now that's just not to say I can't use it. I can actually use the accelerator pedal. It's not what I would choose for long distance driving, but it works. Uh, similarly, there'll be extended control handles, uh, multiple pedals uh, settings, depending on if you're up or down. Now to go down, all you do is two things. Firstly, you fold the pedal up out of the way, so it's no longer interfering with your leg as you attempt to reach the lower pedal. And then there is a lever on the left-hand side of the seat, which if I don't kill myself doing this, where is this? There we go. Easy as. So the last thing to do once you are down is release the steering column and pull it down. It's a very nice feature. Uh, now, of course, officially it's for head out driving or head down driving, but in actuality, it means that I get a nice variety of choice as to just where it is I want to have my steering column. I'll say that I may only have those two options. But it works either way. Uh, unfortunately, even with the seat all the way down, my head is higher than the hatch. So I am not, I'd have to be driving like this. Yeah, I am not a Panther driver, uh, but I fully accept that uh, your typical tanker at the time would, would have been okay. Now, again, I can drive a Sherman. So if a Sherman, if I can drive a Sherman, a Sherman crewman is more comfortable than a Panther crewman and then this Panther. But we're talking about matters of degrees at this point. Transmission on the right, it is the same ZF AK7-200 as would be found on Panther. Uh, nothing unusual there. And again, 
it's missing a lot of stuff. It was a test vehicle, didn't do anything. Circle brake on the right, big brake on the left. Again, a rotatable, although this one is not rotating. Periscope for the driver, although it's probably just going to want to look forward. And the only remaining catch is that the handle for lowering the hat is... You gotta be kidding, there's gotta be a better way of doing this. I mean, it's around the fulcrum, so I guess in theory, if I pull this hard enough... There's probably a way of closing this hatch, but I can't figure it out. Either that, you have somebody do it from the outside. Opening, though, is just pushing straight up, so it's not that bad. Could do with being spring-loaded, it's heavy, but you can do it yourself if you have to. Right. Panther 2. In the end, the go-no-go no go decision for Panther 2 is going to come down to two criteria. The road wheels and the anti-tank rifle protection. Well, they decided that, yes, you could put the steel-tired road wheels on Panther, so that answered that question. Now, it turned out after the fact that they didn't really work, and I think maybe 200, 250 of them were made before they went back to rubber-rimmed, but, of course, they didn't know this at the time. The other one was the anti-tank rifle. Well, it turned out that some genius decided that if you hang a 5mm thin screen of Schurzen from the side of the upper hull, which is well armored and slow, and the tracks and top half of the road wheel, because the road wheels provide a little bit of space protection as well, that would be sufficient to protect against the anti-tank rifle. And with those two problems solved, there was no longer a need for Panther 2. So by saving Panther 1, Schurzen simultaneously kills Panther 2. Right, that's it from Fort Moore. Hope you found it interesting and informative, and I shall see you on the next one. Take care. <laughs>